here if everybody could have a seat. I didn't do that. I did. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for braving the rain to come out for our latest uh, Google DC talk. Uh, I'm Bob Borston and I do communications for Google here in Washington and I'm very happy to welcome Jeff Jarvis, the author of What Would Google Do, uh, to our office here. Uh, Jeff has been described uh, in many ways, in many <laughs> debates, uh, among them uh, as a multi-platform new media consultant. He's known for running buzzmachine.com. He writes a new media column for The Guardian. Uh, he's on the faculty of journalism at the City University of New York, the graduate school, I believe. Among other things in his past, he was the creator and founding editor of Entertainment Weekly and the former TV critic at TV Guide. Did I get that all right? Yeah, okay. But most important for today, he is the author of the new book, uh, What Would Google Do? Advertisement. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, here is the book. Um, and I guess I just want to start off, Jeff, by giving you the chance, the author, to do some bragging uh, about what's in this book and to give us the headlines and the kind of bottom line. It's not a book about Google. It's really a book about the changes in the world. And I think all the more we see as every week goes by that the changes we're going through, I think, are are bigger than a mere financial crisis and more fundamental than a recession or a depression. I believe we're going through a great restructuring into the next age, the next ism, the next whatever. Uh, one of the readers of the book uh, uh, said that, uh, that he saw it as, as moving past um, uh, socialism and, and communism and capitalism to whatever the next ism was, and, and he said it was perhaps Googleism, but because he's German, he called it Googleismus, which I kind of like. That, that had a nice ring to it. Um, but there's something new going on here, and so I think that there were uh, trying to understand this counterintuitive change in the world. I thought the best way to try to judge that was through the lens of Google's success, um, and because Google and its founders and its people have a worldview that understands this new world in ways that they may not be able to express. I, I didn't want to go get Google stories so much as try to see the world in a new way. So a few quick examples. Um, Google grew to be, according to the Times of London, the fastest growing company in the history of the world, not by doing what companies did before, which was to acquire, to, to borrow huge capital, which ain't going to happen, to make huge acquisitions, to control a lot of things. Google doesn't want to control everything, it wants to organize everything. It builds platforms and networks that enable other people to succeed. And I think that's a different way to do business. I believe we're in a world that's uh, an economy that's, that's post-scarcity. And that Google could have built a, a, a scarcity-based model by saying there are only so many people in a day who search for Washington pizza, and we're going to charge what the market will bear for that, the way a newspaper might have. Instead, Google charges on performance, so it's motivated to create abundance, so it created AdSense to go everywhere on the web. Um, Google also understands that you've got to go to where the people are, that it's a distributed model. Uh, the book title really came when I was talking to a bunch of newspapers in London, and magazines in London a few years ago, and they were treating Google as the enemy, as some do, and I said, you know, you've got to look at Google as your model. You've got to be asking, what would Google do? Book title. Uh, and, and that discussion was about thinking distributed and going where the people are. And, and I take Yahoo to task in the book for being the last old media company that thinks the magnet is a brand, you have to come to the brand, we have to advertise to bring you to the brand, you know. We, they spent millions getting that Yahoo sound in our heads. Uh, there is no equivalent to Google because we the people distributed Google and that's a different way to think. So these are different models of how the economy works and then out of that comes a different relationship with your public and that's what I try to get across. Let, let me stop you there because there is one company in the book that you seem to really admire as, aside from Google and that is Apple. And Apple's uh, formula for success as you spell it out here in the book is it violates every single rule I put forward in the book. It is the exception that proves the rule. It does everything. It's, it's closed, controlling, secretive. Uh, not that Google isn't often secretive. Um, uh, and how does it do that? Uh, I think just because it's so damn good and, 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 and we, we love it so much. I asked Rashad Tabakawala, who's a, 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 the innovation chief at Publicist, the ad agency, 
this question, saying, isn't, isn't Apple the anti-Google? Isn't it the anti-matter to Google's matter? And he said, actually, no. He said, because I think what makes them both the same is that both Apple and Google make you feel, as a good brand should, godlike. When you hold your iPhone, which I left back there because of the microphone, you have a Zen experience. You know, when, you, when you go to that Google homepage and there's one little white box behind it which lies all the knowledge of all mankind, uh, you feel omniscient uh, uh, and at peace with the world. Well, at least you do. Yes. Um, <laughs> let me uh, ask you a question from, about the journalist's craft, or the writer's craft in this case. And one of the things that really strikes me about this book is that you deliberately chose not to talk to people at Google. And you write, I did not seek access to Google for this book because I wanted to judge it and learn it from it at a distance. My admiration of Google then does not spring from any relationship with the company, but from its incredible example. You also say that uh, in later, or earlier in the book actually, employees at Google are not permitted to rely on intuition, hunches, wishes, beliefs, and the way things have always been. Now, I I've only been at Google for about three years now, but I can cite more than a few times when things like intuition and wishes actually have had some influence over decisions at the company. Uh, and that some of these Google laws that you espouse have been broken. And so my question really is, don't you think you could have gotten a more accurate picture of the company and therefore passed on to your readers uh, a more, uh, more accurate lessons if you had talked to people at the company and gotten a bigger perspective? I, I debated that, and it was partly my editor who said that the st Google story from Google has been told and that that's not necessarily what we wanted here. This is more of an exercise in reverse engineering and trying to judge from, the, from apart. Part of my thesis here is that in trying to suss out the worldview that Google uses to judge and succeed in the world, I'm going to bet that oftentimes Googlers can't express it. That is so much a part of their DNA. They just simply see the world differently, and you can judge that best by their actions over their words. So yes, I watched Marissa Mayer on videos, and she's magnificent, and she gave me lots of quotes from her videos uh, in the book, and, and that's where I got a lot of that. But I think that in the end, it's not about Google's management. And in fact, I'm sure Google fails at management all the time. It's so darn big, right hand meet left hand. But it's about trying to understand the worldview of the next age. And that's what this is about, and trying to suss that out. So you could do the same exercise, not with Google, but with Amazon or Craigslist or eBay or any company you think has succeeded in this world by seeing the world differently. So you chose Google because? Because it's the big, fastest growing company in the history of the world. It is iconic. It is totemic. It is, it is Google, after all. Um, I also, when I went, I did finally go to Google. I refused to even have lunch at Google because I didn't want to sign the NDA. Uh, and, and after, um, I, no, I got in here today without signing it. I feel like I'm violating some law. Uh, uh, after I did write it, I went out to Mountain View and, and, and did a book talk, uh, fury that I was in a room filled with geniuses who could all tell me how full of crap I was, which you may do soon. Um, and, but I was amazed by the place. And I, and I blogged about it. And I came back. And I was on On the Media with Brooke Gladstone. And she said, after having read my blog post, she said, you fell in love, didn't you? And I said, yeah. And I said, I'm all the, glad, all the happier that I did not go and try to do the book through Google, because it would have seemed as if it came from that relationship. Instead, it does come from a distance. OK. What did I get wrong? Um, I won't be the judge of that. I'll let the, <laughs> the crowd be the judge of what you got wrong. The wise crowd. In keeping with, your, in keeping with your, uh, uh, your notes in the book, I'll say. Um, let's talk for a minute about journalism, because this is something that you uh, spend a lot of time thinking about and writing about in your blog. <laughs> Uh, last October, in response to a, a round of uh, journalists bemoaning the fate of their industry but not blaming themselves, uh, you wrote, I must call, and then you used a family unfriendly word. Um, you said the fall of journalism is indeed journalists' fault. Uh, and you've written similar things elsewhere in it many times. Now, I have to give away my bias. Uh, Jeff is very good about giving away his biases and his, uh, and he has lots of caveats about what he has been involved with in the past. Uh, I was a reporter for the New York Times uh, once upon a time, so I do like journalists. Don't anybody get angry about so like that. <laughs> um, but if you really were trying to hand out blame 
on the front of what is killing newspapers. And aside from pointing the finger at DARPA and Silicon Valley, uh, isn't this really the publisher's fault and not the journalist's fault? When I started Entertainment Weekly magazine, I had no, it was, I just had an idea. And I had no stripes as a business guy. When the circulation director uh, screwed up, to try to use a family friendly term with stuff, and I complained about it, I had no uh, stripes on my sleeve. I'm just an editor. Editors don't know anything. Uh, in journalism school and in work, we were told as journalists, oh, stay away from business, it's dirty. It'll, 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 it'll dirty you up. Um, well, the problem is I think we didn't give proper stewardship to journalism. We've had 15 years since the commercial browser was released in October 94 to have figured out that the world has changed, that only the printing press was going to become an albatross around our necks, that we had to update our products and, and have a new relationship with our public. And we didn't. That is our responsibility. I'm not saying it's the only responsibility of journalists, but this was in response to someone who said journalists are blameless. And I said, if you, if you act as if you have no responsibility for the past, then you're saying you have no responsibility for the future, and I don't accept that. We as journalists must take stewardship of journalism. That's why I teach entrepreneurial journalism at CUNY. I believe that young journalism students have to learn the business. I think we all have to learn the business and be responsible for it. And be responsible for updating and, and reinventing the product and process of journalism for this new world. Now, part of the parcel of this was that I think that I had a naive dream that there would be a Passover of power like January 20th in Washington. The print president hands over to the digital president. An apt metaphor, I'd say. Um, but we don't go merrily along. Well, no. Clayton Christensen at all. Uh, no one wants to disrupt themselves. No one wants to cannibalize and destroy themselves. Especially Monopoly newspapers didn't want to rock their boats. And so they didn't until it's too late. And today we see desperate moves. Oh, if we just charge, everything will be okay. If we just become a, a consortium and hide everything behind a wall, it'll be all right again. It'll be like the old days. No, wrong, dead. The world has fundamentally changed. The rules of the economy and media have fundamentally changed. The relationship of people to, to news and media has changed. A young person said in the New York Times a few years ago that, or about a year ago, um, if the news is important enough, it will find me. So the idea that brands are magnets, people will come to us, that turns around. Everything has changed in fundamental ways. And to sit back and say, oh no, we can't destroy, if you destroy newspapers, you destroy journalism. And how dare you? That's irresponsible. So and that's what I'm trying to get across. So, so what do you think the Salzburgers and, and Murdochs should be doing right now to prepare for this change that they're not doing? Some would say it's too late. Uh, I hope not. Uh, I, I think that what they should do, well, let's go to the, instead of Salzburger and Murdoch, let's go to the Zells, because he has a company in bankruptcy. Well, it's, I was going to say it's truly too late for him. Yeah, well, um, but he may be crazy enough to do, to do some interesting things. Whether he's visionary enough, I don't know. But take the LA Times. Um, last year, the editor of the LA Times, Russ Stanton, said that the total online revenue of the Times is now sufficient to cover the total payroll of both print and online. A lot of caveats there. That it's sold jointly, so which value goes where? The, the newsroom was half the size it was. Nonetheless, I see the glow, the faint glow of an LED at the end of a long tunnel that imagines a digital enterprise of scale that can work in a city. But it only works if you turn off the press, if you turn off the trucks, if you get rid of that cost structure that exists. It only works if you stop trying to do everything yourself and create networks like, dare I say it, Google, and platforms to enable others to succeed on top of you at lower cost and lower risk, by the way, letting you grow much faster as a network, much deeper into the community as a network, and not try to control everything and be the magnet yourself. So I would take, I don't know, the LA Times and say, we're turning off the press next month. We're going to open up a new platform to help everybody in this community report. We're going to figure it out. Now, the New York Times, I'm involved in a project with CUNY and the Times uh, at their new The Local blogs, and my students are working with them. And very, very importantly, the Times is trying to create a platform for the community to report on itself. The New York Times is trying to create the means for people other than the reporters to do journalism. That's really important. So I think we see those faint glimmers, those LEDs way out there of a new hope. But the real hope I have, I think, is probably for entrepreneurs who will start new things, and then maybe infuse or get bought or buy the old and work along. Um, and we have to imagine the 20% rule brought to the journalism industry and who would create the next Google of, of news. Okay, let's turn to another subject here, um, which is the economic crisis. 
because you said earlier today, and you write in your book, uh, that we're living through a great restructuring of the economy and society, starting with a fundamental change in our relationships, how we are linked and intertwined, and how we act, nothing less than that. Um, isn't that fun being quoted at yourself? I, I, yeah, um, I, I, I dread what's supposed to be on the next page. <laughs> Uh, well, I have some things to dread. What I want to ask you is really this, is how would the current economic crisis, in your mind, be different if people had understood the change we're going through? And more importantly, what should we be, well, how should we apply this change now to make sure it doesn't happen again? I really do think we're moving from an industrial age into some new age, a digital age, call it what you will. A lot of book titles will try to figure it out, whether it's Google Ismos or whatever it is. It's something new, and we have to manage for that. So my fear in Washington of the bailout is that we're bailing out the past when we should be bailing out the future, rather than bailing out companies that are clearly going to fail, models that are clearly failing and over. I understand why we're doing it. But the sooner we get past that to instead investing in innovation and invention and infrastructure for that new world, the better off we are. So rather than filling potholes, I'd rather dig up streets to put in broadband everywhere. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to look at education brought to a put, uh, education is, is built for the industrial world, and I'd like to bring the 20% rule to every school and university in this country and have people create things and understand how to look at things differently. I think we've got to look at understand that the world has fundamentally changed and we've got to build for this new world. So trying to still protect the past, learn from newspapers alone. Protection is not a strategy for the future. Trying to protect what we've had in the past doesn't work in this new world for the future. So the way to uh, move forward, the way to get hope in the world again is to get innovation and invention in the world, I believe. Now, I'm a cockeyed optimist. Um, you know, the internet gave me a second childhood with a gray beard at age 54, and I believe in this new world with a, an obnoxious fervor, I'll admit. But I think that we are too much looking past, and we've got to try to turn around the lens and look forward. So, so practically speaking, though? Practically speaking, I think the, uh, using white spaces, which Google has pushed to get broadband everywhere, finding means to get broadband absolutely everywhere in this country to lead there again. I think to uh, spend money on retraining people to do uh, uh, different kinds of tasks. I think recognizing that we're going to have fewer people working as employees of companies and more people working independently as entrepreneurs and finding ways to support that through uh, the law and through uh, tax structure. Um, and to start to turn the economy around in that way and try to be a world leader again uh, in that. And that recognizes that it's not the old model. That's the hard part. The people in power. I was at, I get accused in the book of, of name dropping. And, and, and it's true, but I do something worse than that. I place drop. So I mentioned Davos too much. I was going to say Davos. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I was at Davos this last January. And the only reason I get there is because I, I help them on blogging. You know, straight away, well, these blog things. And so I got to go to Davos. And I said, sure. Um, but I had this sense this last January. The question is, were we, um, we were among the powerful. Were we, were we among the, the problem or the solution? Are the right people there making decisions now? I think we've got to discover the new talent in a way like, well, you know, not to plug Google, but the way that Google does and find people who think in new ways and figure out how to invest in them. Um, and we've got to get past as quickly as we can bailing out banks and automobiles to try to help people survive that, but not to think that that's going to make us OK. It's not. L let me just say to those of you in the audience that we will be taking questions and keeping it Or challenges spirit. or arguments. Yes, uh, although I hope not speeches. Um, in a few moments, so if you want to think about those, that would be great. Um, let's talk for a minute about another thing we obsess about here in Washington, and that's government. And you make the requisite caveats in your section of the book about Google and government, uh, about not wanting to crowdsource government, about needing to have uh, people who filter, so and so forth. Uh, but you lean towards what you call geek rule. Are you really sure that you want geeks running the government? I instead thought that it was probably an inevitability and wondered what that would be like. And so I tried to look at the signals we get from Google and how it looks at the world. And, and see, I'm going to do it again. There's a penalty. I'm only allowed three times in a day, but I'm going to mention Davos. Uh, I was there last January. I've only been three times. 
And uh, I went to a session with Al Gore and Bono about the problems of the world, and Gore gave, with the force and sweat that he does, his view of the environment, carbon taxes, regulation, prohibitions. Then I went up the mountain, and I saw, metaphorically in, in, in reality, and I saw the Google.org folks, folks, Larry, Larry, and Sergey, um, and heard their view. And in Google.org, they are spending money and investing in the idea of trying to get clean, renewable power cheaper than coal. And Larry Brilliant said, uh, the, head of, the then head of Google.org said, imagine when we, if we didn't have to conserve. That's Google thinking about abundance. So it struck me that engineers and entrepreneurs and inventors see a problem and they don't see prohibitions and regulation and trying to control it. They see trying to see whether there is a solution because they have that optimism, that hubris of the engineer and the inventor and the scientist to think they can have that. And I would wish for that. Now, whether we get all the other characteristics of, of, of geeks in government, I don't know, but I would love to see that characteristic brought to government. So what did you think of Obama's kind of town hall meeting, online town hall meeting? I think it's right now, it's symbolism. But it's important symbolism. Uh, I just recorded a podcast yesterday for The, for the Guardian, and, and the question that they, we discussed was whether or not he was, like George Bush, trying to go around the media. And my fellow blogging professor, Jay Rosen at NYU, said that, you know, who says what the media is? He's not going around anybody. The media aren't the only ones who can ask the questions. So the people can ask questions, too. And I think that's all true. But I think it's a symbolic step. I think the more important thing that Obama has promised that we have to get to is transparency. And what that means to me, I, I, I joke in the book uh, that we should abolish the Freedom of Information Act and turn it on its head and say that rather than us asking the government for our information, the government should have to ask our permission for hiding it from us. And that if our information in the government, our acts of the government, the, the, the knowledge of the government were all searchable and linkable, what would that give us? Well, it would give us the value of government brought back to us, which is what really page rank does. It returns the wisdom of the crowd back to the people. And it would give us the opportunity to have millions of watchdogs who could look at all this data and see what our government is doing. And I would hope that perhaps down the line it might even turn the conversation to the positive. The conversation about government is always negative. It's always, get the bastards. And there are bastards to get. We know that. But there are people who really want to do good, and there are people in the, in the, out in the world who want to do good. And if we could try instead to join together, I know it's my optimism coming out again, and try to do things together, that'd be. So I tell the story in the book of my Starbucks idea, where customers come in and they, and they have ideas, but unlike a suggestion box, the discussion is in public with fellow customers and with employees. So one guy came in, and he said, you know what I want? I want to take my Starbucks card, where I have my money on it now. I want to put my standing drink order on it. When I come in, I want to wave it. My money goes out, my drink order goes in, I go around the end, I get my drink. There were four or five ideas with a similar thread, and that thread was, Starbucks, your lines are too long. But not one of the people in these discussions complained about the lines. Instead, they suggested constructive ideas for how to solve the problem. Can't we do that with government? And I think Obama started that. The question is, will the bureaucracy uh, and the po politics of government enable it to become truly transparent, but I think that's the cause we got to have. That's the government for the new ism and age. So people should be asking for a grande or a venti tax cut. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, let's have one argument before we open it up to the audience here, and that's about free expression. Um, don't be evil, everybody has debated this back and forth, but one of the few places in your book where you disagree with something that Google has done is when you fault us for censoring our search results in China on our Chinese domain, google.cn. And it's now happening with YouTube in Korea. Right. And you say that you don't agree with our uh, argument that a hampered internet is better than no internet at all. Uh, as someone who's been deeply involved in this issue and has negotiated with human rights groups uh, trying to come up with a code of conduct for how we should operate, we and other internet companies should operate in repressive regimes, um, I actually think that your view here runs counter to the ethic that you espouse. Because if Google did things your way, that is not offer any kind of internet to the Chinese people or only offer google.com, which they can't see because it's essentially strangled by the Great Firewall, um, then 230 million people would be denied any access 
to this kind of information. Now, admittedly, this isn't perfection, right? We're getting rid of certain things the Chinese government doesn't want internet users to see. But then, if we didn't operate CN, they would only have the choice of Baidu, which is a Chinese company and which certainly censors a great deal more than we do. So I guess that my question really is, how can you make this argument to take away information from people? The question is, what would happen if people couldn't get Google at this stage? I think that, you know, would there be a Google revolt? The question to me is, does Google have more power in this realm than even it knows? Uh, Google lives and dies by freedom of speech, so Google should be the preeminent defender of free speech the world around. Now, whether that's cutting it off, or whether that's negotiating harder with the Chinese, or whether that's being more public about it, or whether that's putting that as a priority, yes, even ahead of the business interests of being in China. And there's other companies I can complain about whose policies in China as well, who go in because they see the, 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 the wealth of that huge market. But I think that Google has more power than even it knows to defend the principle of speech. And I believe firmly, Optimist coming out again, that the internet itself will tear down repressive controlling regimes the world around, except perhaps in North Korea where there's no internet, which goes to your point, I understand. But I think that there's enough freedom of information now, there's enough paths around, there's enough ways for people to learn now that the stronger we can be in this, the better, and we can force these regimes into a new age. Maybe, maybe not, but that's the, it's, a, it's a gamble, it's a bet either way, that's all we're doing, both of us is betting and arguing. The question is that there is some conflict of interest on Google's stance because it's a damn rich market. But well, you don't want to cede it to Baidu. It could be a really rich market. Yes, well, that's what everybody's saying. Right. So Whether you're Cisco or the New York Times company, which has a bout.com there, or whether you're, you know, for whom I used to consult, or, or other companies, a lot of people are rushing to China. And when they do that, they give up some principle. So if we look at, at you know, a different issue, if we look at apartheid, the boycott of South Africa had an impact. It put a pressure on that regime. Do we believe that freedom of speech and freedom of political activity is a principle of this world that we should stand up for? And if so, how should we do it? That's the debate we really should be having, I think. But depriving, I mean, that South Africa uh, uh, analogy could be questioned uh, because it's depriving people of material stuff is very different from depriving them of information. I guess I put the challenge back. What has Google done to pressure the Chinese government on this? Well, we have everyday interactions with them in which we question, in writing and in person, their moves. And, and who whether wins? Or not this is, well, in most cases, they win. Yeah. Because they're the regime that's in charge. And if you don't follow their rules, well, then you don't operate in their country. And I, I will go back to the argument that I really believe very strongly, that we are better off offering them most than nothing at all, because that's that's really, that is really what we face there. It sounds very black and white, and I don't like to sound that way, but in this case, when we started Google.c, and we did it because Google.com was strangled, and nobody could get at and it. And we have the other issue, though, is if you, if you go with the must-follow local laws argument, which is the way we are, you have Yahoo handing people over to the government in China. You, you, you uh, have to decide at some point what your principle is. And, um, and, and where, the wall, where your own wall is. And, and I'm not arguing that your, I'm not saying that your argument is invalid, but I'm saying that we're both trying to guess what the best path is. All right, enough of my hobby horse. There must be plenty of hobby horses from the people out here in the audience. If you want to stand up at the mic and identify yourself, please, and again, no speeches. Hi, I'm Andy Schwartzman with Media Access Project. Uh, I have a complex question. I hope I don't screw it up in trying to be succinct and to make it easier. Try to Twitter it, yeah. To make it easier, uh, let's limit it just to U.S. domestic situation. I'm concerned about the problem of people who are left along the side of the road. Uh, the value of the network increases proportionally with the number of people with access to it. Uh, the number of people who, by virtue of age, geography, and especially economics, who cannot now and will not in the near term, three years, five years, eight years, be able to participate 
in the benefits that you talk about, the ability to function as citizens with the government in, in these better and different ways and so forth. Uh, do we run the risk of exacerbating societal differences by creating uh, a uh, underclass? There's 30% of the people who right now say they're not even interested in getting a broadband connection. Uh, do we run a risk of creating an underclass of people? Uh, it's it's the, digital divide, the digital divide question. And uh, uh, I, I think that if we look at technology uh, ad 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 adoption in the past, it always comes along. And so people didn't have radios, they had radios. They didn't have TVs, phones, the, mobile phones. Majority of the population has these things. Uh, I don't think we can manage to the point of saying that 100% must have it, but this goes back to my point about investing in broadband and investing in the technology to make it more open. You can get very inexpensive machines now. Um, uh, we, can, we can put broadband out wirelessly in efficient ways, something that Google has fought for with the white spaces. And I think we've got to make it a national priority. Uh, it's also a worldwide priority, uh, but I think the access to the internet will probably be mobile phones. We'll have three billion more people coming on the internet very soon, and that's a beautiful thing, and what can we do about that? And Eric Schmidt said to Jim Cramer a while ago, if we now believe anything that's said there, um, <laughs> that uh, Google will soon make more money on mobile than from the internet. So I think we shouldn't just look at computers and broadband connections to a home as the means of access to this new world. Let me just pause there for a second because one of the things that you don't emphasize in this book is mobile and the future of mobile. Uh, was, would the next version or the paperback have more about that? Maybe it's an area where I'm too old and I didn't yet have my iPhone. <laughs> I think that's pretty much it. It wasn't part of okay. my experience. My son, my, my, my 17 year old son writes Facebook apps and has sold them for good amounts of money and he got an iPhone before I did and I was jealous and my wife said uh, well, if you teach dad how to make apps, then he too can get an iPhone. Uh, but when I got a book advance, I got an iPhone. Okay. Let that be a lesson to all of us. Hi, I'm Walter Frick at the U.S. Green Building Council. I, you've written a little bit about how you'd like to do research into the various functions at a daily newspaper uh, and sort of get a sense of how much of it actually is beat reporting, investigative reporting, that sort of thing. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and what functions you see uh, sort of in the future under your model still done by professional journalists rather than sort of crowdsourced or something like that? I think the assumption in the discussion about the death and follow-up of newspapers is that you take an old organization will be replaced by a new organization, a new company, and, and a new product. I don't think that's the case. I think that we're going to see something replaced by a network uh, with many different players in it, each of smaller size but an aggregate much bigger, that operates for a lot of different models and motives in there. And we'll have some kind of new news organization that part of its value is that it organizes the news, that it curates, that it collects, that it, it, it encourages people to, to create content. It makes it better by educating people. Those are new roles, but I think that'll be probably some new form of a news organization. We'll have, I see we see it now, journalists who are laid off who are going off and starting their own blogs and trying to create their own businesses. Uh, when the Washington Post offered us buyouts last time and this time, I wish that they would offer every one of those talented people a blog and ad sales for it. Because those are brands they made, those are people they trust and know. So we'll see professionals still in some new form of organization, we'll see professionals um, uh, in those kinds of independent businesses, we'll see bloggers who become more and more professional and better and better at this. We'll see organizations like Huffington Post and ProPublica that may be foundation or public supported adding into this new pie, this new ecosystem of journalism. We'll also see data from new sources. The more the government data becomes open and searchable and we can all look at it and examine it, the more that's part of a new ecosystem of news. So it sounds confusing and disorganized, but that's just where the opportunity is that we can organize this new world with not just the ways that Google organizes information, but also, well, the other way Google organizes the world is by selling ads for it. And, and these are the ways that I think we can organize this and uh, have a lot of people contributing to a new world of news. It's going to be messy. And, and, and that was, uh, that for me is a fairly recent revelation, um, naively. Uh, I was too optimistic, but I think we're going to get on the other side of this. I think there's a new and exciting world of news. Thank you. Could I ask you to go to the microphone for your question? Thank you. It's very unbloggy to do this this way, I know. I think you just kind of uh, answered my question, but it was in part um, 
so if the advertising model is not working for journalism, what are some of the most promising alternative models? And one, I guess, would be uh, information providers like Google or ISPs would collect a fee that would distribute to media outlets. I was wondering if you thought that's a good idea. Oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm Winter Casey. I write for National Journal. Um, there's a huge debate right now about charging for content, and, and I'm on the side that says that that doesn't go with the flow of the internet business model, and it's not going to work. It's trying to preserve an old piece of this. Uh, there's another debate that says, can we make all ISPs share their revenue with content creators in a cable model? Well, but who are the content creators? Are they sharing with the New York Times and Huffington Post, or what about Buzz Machine, my blog? Who gets that money? I, I don't think that works either. I think that advertising will be a great part of this. Uh, we have to look at new models. And again, this is a fairly recent revelation. I talk in the book about how Google uh, manages abundance rather than scarcity. And I just realized the other day that we're still selling scarcity in advertising and media. We have to find new models. Uh, yesterday, I blogged about the idea of making your customers into sellers. And how can we enable the whole of our customer base to sell things? Maybe there's citizen-based ad sales, for example. Um, uh, maybe there's new models there. Is this all rather amorphous? Yes. And that's the problem with this. There's two debates here. The woe is me, the world is gone, let's preserve the world debate. Uh, that's that side. Or there's the happy, look at all the possibilities, which is my fault. I'm on that side, I'm saying. Um, and so we have to make it more specific. And how do we make this debate more specific? And so part of what I'm trying to do is at the City University of New York, I've started the New Business Models for News Project to try to flesh out business models with MBAs and analysts and companies like newspapers and Google, and to imagine both new business models, new revenue sources, as well as new frameworks for how things can be created. You can create a newspaper on Google today. It'd be a little messy, but you can, publishing tools, ad tools, analytic tools, uh, 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 content tools of all sorts are all there to create something very cheaply, and I think we have to reinvent what that is. But, but you wouldn't advise that Google get into the news content no. business? No, because I think it puts you in channel conflict. Uh, and uh, only you have said, Google has said in the past, you don't want to own content, and I hope that stays the case, because it makes you uh, able to serve all masters. But I think you can package the support to the content business better and uh, offer things that could be of value, whether, or whether Google does it or whether you know, it's, other, it's plug and play and others do it. Uh, uh, I think that's important. I'm, I'm, I'm a partner in a company called Daylife that, not unlike Google News, aggregates news. And that's part of the structure of finding the good stuff. There. Is it really going to be possible for newspaper companies that exist now to move into the new age? Uh, in, in Washington, in the realm of local news, the Washington Post has decided it's going to hire community reporters, and that's its step into the new age. And the difference between a community reporter and the old reporter is that they're paid ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 less. Uh, otherwise, there's really not much difference. They, they still have the same editing filtering process. Uh, they're, they're still employees of the post. Uh, and the local news is really coming from neighborhood listservs, from uh, individual blogs, people who are covering their own neighborhoods. And uh, if a large media company, the Post, the Times, the, uh, even the Examiner, gets a tip uh, gets a story idea from one of those sources, it won't use it if it has to credit it. But if it, if I, I, it has think, to give a, if it has to give credit I, to another source, it won't appear. I think appear. that's changing. You have the New York Times, and the New York Times is you know the temple in, in the country. And look at what they're doing. They're now uh, have an alternate page where they're they're linking to all kinds of other sources. Uh, I think that's important. Uh, as I said, they're creating this platform, the local, where they're trying to f we're trying to find the ways to get the pe the community to report on itself and to help them do that. Um, I think yes, absolutely, it's possible for legacy companies to do this. Is there time to change over? Maybe they won't be the ones who'll be in advance, but I think that they're learning fast because they know they have to now. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Uh, I'm Chris Fotis, uh, web managing editor for Aviation Week. Um, we're in the middle of this transition ourselves. And um, I want to get a feel for how sweeping your vision is. I've read the book. I've seen the movie. I have the bobblehead doll. So I know where you're coming from. But 
it's a challenge for us and for a lot of other publications based in Washington. There are lots of journalists employed in this town that work for trade pubs or high-priced publications um, that are pretty vulnerable in this new environment. We have what we call the free site, which is what I run at aviationweek.com, that includes a small number of all the stories that we sell for higher price inside the firewall. And what I want to hear from you is whether, I guess I wanted to say is, give it to us straight, Jeff. Does that model have any kind of future at all? If anybody can charge for content, it's somebody who has that kind of highly specialized, unique content. But even so, once knowledge is known, it's a commodity. You know, if you say that, uh, oh my God, Boeing is about to lay off n number of people, as soon as that knowledge is out there, it's a commodity. You don't own it, you can't control it, you can't make that scarce. Um, I think I would look uh, for a model to the tech blog world where TechCrunch is a heck of a good business now. Paid content was bought by The Guardian, for whom I work. Um, there are other examples uh, creeping along, in, you know, area by area, where uh, uh, more open blogs and communities of blogs can cover an industry with extreme depth. And I think that's where it goes. And I think the question is, how could you not just create your own content and try to control it? How could you enable uh, 10 times, 100 times as many people to help you report on this industry in ways you never could before? I'm sure this violates some rule, but I just wanted to clarify. Part of that transition is, and thank you very much, of part of the transition is we do have bloggers, we do have podcasts, we do have videos. That's part of my job, making a lot of those things happen. And I will say there is a big difference among individuals in our staff as far as people who want to contribute to that and people who don't. I'm saying it's not just your staff. The point is, just as in the community example, how do you help a community of people report on this industry in ways, and, and, and by help them, I mean you promote them, you sell ads for them, you help promote them, you, you, you educate them to do it better, you, you find the best ones. Um, there's all kinds of value you can add. The obnoxious way to put this, and that's what I specialize in, um, is that you've got to make a business no longer out of extracting value from the marketplace, but adding value to the marketplace. And, and that's what I think Google did. And then they extract plenty of value on top of that. My name is Gray Brooks. I'm uh, most recently from the new media team of uh, the Obama campaign. Congratulations. Thank you. And to you. Uh, I guess my question comes out of, of both, you know, emotional support and also intellectual interest in Google. And when you take an example like the country of the United States, I think it's very worthwhile and productive to imagine the risk and the scenarios by which America could lose its standing, can lose its power. You know, how can that come about? And I think it's a worthwhile thought experiment with Google as well. And so I would wonder what your thoughts are as far as both in the near future and the distant future, how Google can fall or falter. Yeah, I, I do say this in the book, though I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much uniformly admiring of Google. Uh, I, I do think that it, it, it is already so big that right hand and left hand have a problem talking and, and its management by chaos could become anarch anarchic, um, anarchistic, uh, that uh, government could look at it and say it's too big in America. We, we love big, we hate big. We love success, we hate success. Um, and and uh, uh, that's difficult. Um, I think there are other frontiers where others could succeed. Uh, Google organizes the world's information, uh, but organizing the world's people, organizing, uh, helping us organize ourselves uh, is a huge frontier. And Google, of course, is fighting this at open social with with Facebook and maybe some other player in a dorm room now is going to create it. I think that live, Google's not good at live. Uh, uh, that's why Twitter is important. There's rumors of Google buying Twitter. Uh, they've been denied so far. Um, uh, the deep web, I think Google probably have a good role in. Uh, local, Google's already making uh, important strides there, but local's a huge frontier. But I think part of the assumption here is that, oh, Google now owns the world, so if they fail at anything, they've now failed because they don't own the world anymore. And that's not going to be the case. Google will not own everything. I don't want it to own everything. But I think other companies will learn from its example and, and build success. Um, the country is an interesting one, too. Uh, I, I think I saw in, in, a, in a Washington Post column uh, yesterday based on all the G20 stuff happening in Europe that part of what we're seeing is a cultural resistance to change. You know, we heard about this in different parts of the world, but it's true in Europe, too, right now. Uh, and that was the point is that we in the Obama administration, you know, oh, we're going to change everything. Well, ee, we wish you wouldn't change everything. Well, the world's changing anyway. And there's going to be a fight around that, I think, that's going to be very difficult and cultural. Hi, my name is Carrie O'Connor. I work for the U.S. Department of State. And essentially, I'd like to know what would Google do if it had to run a government organization? 
For example, you know, transparency is an extremely noble goal, and I can think of a lot of government employees who would love nothing better than to not have to do another FOIA request because the information is already out there. However, uh, the government doesn't yet have the capacity to handle that kind of transparency when particularly as government workers, it's hard enough for us to collaborate and communicate amongst each other. Um, what techniques of innovation for internal organizational management that Google uses could be applicable to government? And what would Google do if it had to fill out an OMB 300 exhibit? I'm sure you get a far better answer to my left than from me. Uh, uh, personally, I would panic. Uh, uh, <laughs> having, having served in the government for seven years and having worked at the State Department uh, and having arrived there uh, to be greeted by a, a Wang computer. <laughs> I don't know if you all remember the little screens with the green letters on them, but that's what I was greeted by. Uh, similar to the dial phone that was on a desk in the old executive office building when we arrived in 1993. I don't have a great deal of faith that the government can adapt that quickly. I think, however, that the Obama administration is showing in so many ways uh, its uh, commitment to actually trying the new tools and to change things as quickly as possible. Uh, there's been a couple of very interesting interviews with Vivek Kundra in particular, who's the new CIO in the White House. So I would, I would recommend that you take a look at those, obviously. Anyway. And I think Google could help. Uh, part of this is, well, first let me say this for caveat here. Uh, we talk about transparency as a virtue, and it is. Let's stipulate first that Google ain't very transparent about some things. And, and it, it's a do as I say, not as I do kind of thing, where Google expects all of us to be transparent because if we want to be found in its search, we have to put ourselves out online and live in public. And that's the, the, the deal we have to make if we want to live in this new world. Google, however, makes people sign NDAs and it doesn't reveal how it picks Google news sources and it doesn't reveal its ad splits and, and it's secretive. Fine, stipulated. Having said that, I think that, uh, I, I guess I would start with two ideas. One is uh, a framework, not to use, not to hire a whole bunch of technologists to, to create new systems to make government transparent. Ah, no. Use what exists. How do you, how do you make an API for government and an API for search and, and, and publicness that says, here's how to put stuff up so it can be searched? And, and Google could certainly help with that. And so a framework and a, and a notion of it. People much smarter than I are working on this. Uh, the Personal Democracy Forum with Andrew Ruscha and Mika Sifri are, are working on this and other, other organizations like that. Second, um, we have to start with a, a pilot project, I think. And I would take one agency and say, you're it. Uh, maybe the FCC would be a good one. And say, uh, you know, from now on, everything you do as a default has to be public. And that affects how you do things. It affects how you put stuff out there. It affects Lord knows the culture. But it, like the don't be evil motto, the don't be evil model, I, uh, motto I learned in, in, in listening to things about Google, as I understand it was not an effort of high hubris to say we're virtuous and no one else is, that it was, it was instead a license to employees to say in a meeting when something was discussed, should we do that? Is that evil? And, and I think that's a very important motto. And by the way, if the words don't be evil had been etched over the, over the doors of Wall Street and insurance companies, maybe we'd be in better shape if a few more employees had felt empowered to say, should we sell toxic assets? Isn't that evil? But that aside, <laughs> if you had a similar rule for this agency that says, do it in public, and that the employees of the agency are empowered to say, ah, is that public? Um, maybe it starts to spread the virus of publicness. It's going to be a really hard thing to do, both on the technology side and on the cultural side, but you've got to start somewhere. I, I would add that the State Department has actually done some interesting work already with the mashup it's done of uh, Secretary Clinton's travels around the world. Uh, which is a new uh, feature on your site. Um, and I think that there is movement there that uh, shows promise. Sir. Um, Brent Finnegan, I'm a local news blogger in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and I also work with uh, James Madison University trying to develop their new media strategy there. And, um, and what I'm trying to pitch them is something that's involving the, you know, really opening up the website and involving students and really uh, doing something I haven't seen done on a university website. But it, in a way, it doesn't help since I work for the Office of Public Affairs that you say that PR cannot be Googleified. Um, and I, I kind of disagree with you a little bit where the marketing and PR overlaps. And I feel like you can, you can involve that, you know, 10% or whatever of your hardcore fans to kind of obviously not 
if it's ongoing litigation or something, that, that doesn't count. But, you know, if something happens, you can involve them and, and try and get them to, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if you could speak a little bit to that, right. but I, I feel like there's overlap between marketing and PR in some Well, areas. there is, I think. Um, uh, and the reason, by the way, that I said PR couldn't be fully Googleified like law is that because you generally have clients. You got to do what the client says, and you can't be transparent. And the way to be transparent is to say, oh, client, you messed up. I fire you. That's not going to happen. So, so that's just my argument there. But certainly both law and PR and marketing have used the tools of the web and Web 2.0 to advance their businesses wisely. Yeah, I, among my obnoxious you know, aphorisms in line is uh, Steve Rubell, who's a PR guy, interviewed me for Ad Age, and I, I used this line uh, this week, that advertising is failure. That it, in the ideal world, your product is great, your customer loves your product, and the customer spreads your product and even supports it. Uh, and we see that happening all over. And so you, a company has to ask, well, why would I spend money on advertising? It's because that didn't work. Now, obviously, I want them to spend money on advertising because it's going to support media, and it's, there's still going to be advertising. But if you, if you try to zero-base marketing in that way, what it comes out of it is that the first dollars go to a great product because now price isn't going to make any difference, locality is not going to make any difference, everything's a UPS truck drive away. Um, so your first dollar goes into a great product to improve the product. The second dollar goes like Zappos into customer service, into your relationships with your public. And then I think part of what you do is become collaborative. One of the important lessons of Google is that it releases betas, which is its way of saying this product is incomplete, it's unfinished, it's imperfect, it's flawed, help us finish it. And that makes it collaborative and people join in, like Starbucks and that idea. So when you've done all those things, you've established a new relationship to your public, which I think is where you're going. That's where you can go. Then yes, you'll still advertise because people don't know your product or they, they don't know your new path or your new price, fine. But the important priority is the new relationship. And in that way, maybe actually PR stands ahead of marketing because it's about relationships. Sure, thanks. We'll take these two more questions. Uh, I'm Mark McCarthy with Georgetown University. Um, I want to go back to the question on uh, complying with with the laws of local jurisdictions that was raised earlier. Um, and and uh, my question has to do with what, the, what, a, what a productive role for government might be in, in that area. Um, and you, you saw that Google got, got caught between a choice of you know, playing by their rules or, or getting out. And the US government tried to respond to that by saying, uh, you know, there's a, if we pass a law that says you, know, you can't comply with the laws of China and still be in compliance with the laws of the United States, that might help, but that would really create the same sort of conflict, only this time a conflict between US law and Chinese law. And you have other examples of that where you know, SWIFT, the sort of back office transaction system for financial institutions, got caught between the US Treasury Department and the EU privacy rules. Uh, is there a role for government kind of working out these differences instead of saying to the intermediaries, you figure it out? Is, isn't there a role for government to say, we got to work this out among ourselves and create a kind of harmonized system where the intermediaries don't have to make these kind of choices? I'll, I'll take the professor's prerogative here and ask you, professor, do you, th you think that there is? I, I, th I think inevitably there's going to have to be something done. Whether it's feasible to have governments do it at this point is an open question in my mind. But I'm not sure I know what the alternative answer would be. If you leave it up to the intermediaries, you're in effect devolving to them a lot of decisions about harmonizing conflicting local laws that really are public decisions that should be open to a bit more public input than allowing it to be decided by the intermediaries. Certainly in the discussion about, about financial regulation right now, uh, we in America are resisting this idea of, of worldwide legislation and, and, and regulation. Uh, and it's a, it's, we're rather allergic to it. Uh, and, I, and I think that kind of uh, uh, cultural change by fiat generally doesn't work very well. But, I, but the question is, does the government have a role in leadership of the discussion and pushing in both diplomacy and in discussion and in research uh, where that goes? I think that they do. Um, and so uh, the problem becomes whether it's Google or the US government dealing with China, it's when enlightened self-interest becomes sheer self-interest. Uh, and, and that's understandable. Uh, that's part of the role of, of, of both entities, but you're still asking the same question again, I think, is where's the principle and how can we best try to stand up for it? And that's a vague answer, I know, but yes, I think government has a role in trying to help push and give cover. Part of what could happen, too, is uh, I had a lot of fights with the FCC back in the Howard Stern days. I'm a big Howard Stern fan and also a First Amendment fan. 
And the problem was that we gave no cover to Congress to stand up for free speech in the First Amendment. Because otherwise what was happening was if in voting for higher fines and more uh, tools for the FCC to censor, uh, they were voting against porn and, and smut and the end of civilization. When they should have do, been doing the opposite and voting for free speech and the First Amendment and what America stands for, by God. But we in the public weren't giving them cover. Politically, there was no cover to say, oh yay, good for you, you voted for free speech. No, it was, ah, that guy voted for smut. So I think the same thing here is we have to find the ways to give cover, and we in the public have that first responsibility more than government. So we've got to find the ways to bring that to policy. I would say, though, from our perspective, uh, and from the perspective of the different companies and the human rights groups and the socially responsible investors that are part of what we now call the Global Network Initiative, which is a kind of consortium that's been put together to protect free expression and privacy in the countries in which we operate where the regimes are not so nice, about those things, that it would be very helpful to have government help uh, and for the government to do things like it's begun to do. For example, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is the foreign aid uh, body that the Bush administration uh, put together, includes internet censorship in its criteria for democracy, uh, that therefore you have to hit that criteria in order to receive aid. We are hopeful that that kind of attitude will spread and that people from Treasury to state and, for, and so forth will adopt more of this uh, attitude and then take it abroad when we have troubles, as we do all the time. Uh, for example, YouTube being blocked in China twice recently. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to comment uh, uh, briefly on what you were saying before on um, uh, the collaborative nature of the Google beta testing and how it creates these, you know, intrigued, you know, uh, active users. I'm in PR, and what we've seen as you know journalism is going down is that the number of citizen journalists is increasing. Do you think that it's possible to retain brand ambassadors, or are people so kind of fickle at this point? We have a very short attention span. You know, I didn't like my BlackBerry last week, so I got an iPhone within three days. You know, it's, it's a very fast turnover. Do you think it's possible to maintain some level of, of you know, long-term relationship? And also, uh, a great April Fool's joke, by the way. Google, the Gmail, I, I enjoyed it when I oh. logged in. Thanks. <laughs> um, yes, I think so. Uh, you know, the question you're really asking, I think, is how much can people be involved with brands and products? Uh, that starts and stops with the quality of the product and the quality of the service, obviously. But if you stipulate that that's good, then where does that go? I think the more people can have an ownership in that, the better. And uh, I had a kerfuffle with Dell a while ago uh, that is, is the opening of the book, where Dell at first, I complained about Dell, I, I, I went onto my blog having had it and I said under a headline, Dell sucks, which isn't quite as juvenile as it sounds because if you go to Google and put in any brand followed by the word sucks, you get the true consumer reports. And Dell at first ignored the bloggers. They said, no, 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 come to us. We're not going to go to you. Well, then a year later, Dell really turned, turned around amazingly, phenomenally. And they started blogging with a human, credible uh, voice. Um, uh, second, they, they sent technicians out to solve bloggers' problems. And surprise, what happened? The bloggers said, wow, Dell solved my problem. They created a Dell idea storm, like the Star my Starbucks idea, same platform from Salesforce, where people suggest ideas and they, and they take it over. Bring this, let's say, for a second to the auto industry. The auto industry thought that its secret sauce was secrecy. Oh, we know best about cars. We're working on something really great. We'll show you a few concepts, but no, it's in the laboratory. Wait till it comes out. And, and, and the mythology of the mass production era, because of the way you had to tool up, whether it's a car or a newspaper, by the way, is that when we put it out, we have one chance to put it out, and it's perfect. Well, of course it's not. Of course it's not perfect. Of course it's flawed. Now, mind you, I don't want to drive a beta car or fly in a beta jet, but if people had opened up their process earlier on, what magic could have happened? Every time I get in my car, every single time, I curse it and its makers and the radio makers because they didn't put in a 39-cent plug to plug in my iPhone, iPod, Walkman, whatever came before. If they'd had the means to listen to us, what would have happened? As we look out of the ashes of Detroit, I think the three companies will be replaced by 300 or 3,000 companies. Imagine a car that's built on an API or a spec so that I can get that car and make it truly mine. I can get the radio I want with that damn plug. I can get the seats I want, the, the dash I want, whatever I want, the disaggregated, reaggregated car. 
Well, part and parcel of that is that I have more control over that. I have more ownership in it. Whether it's because I could help make it and, and specify it, or whether it's because I had a role in this process earlier on, I knew other people did, and this came from the people, that's how you open up a brand. Not by messages, but by true collaboration. Now again, as you said earlier, I don't want the full um, rule of the crowd. I believe in having a republic. I believe in having an author. I believe in having a chef and a designer. But why shouldn't they be smarter by hearing the wisdom of the crowd? If there's any lesson from Google, I think the first and foremost is that we out here in the world like to create and leave our mark. And finding the way, that's lesson one. Lesson two, two is that Google found the way to listen to that, to hear that wisdom and return it to us, whether it's in the form of page rank or blogger or whatever it is. And so the way to help people own a brand is to truly have them own the brand and have them own the product by having a role in And uh, that's part of the lesson here, I think. Let me exercise the interviewer's uh, prerogative and ask you the last question. You said uh, in the book and also in your blog that you bought Google stock at $512. <laughs> now, Don't listen to anything I say about the, the economy as a result, yes. No, no, that wasn't my point because <laughs> I, I actually don't look at the stock price from day to day because it's too scary. Um, but my question is first, do you regret that? And second, what do you think is the one thing Google should do right now to make your investment come, come back to a better level? Uh, I have too many regrets on the stocks that I own, including holding on to Time Inc., Time Warner from my days there. So it's a much greater regret. Um, uh, so no, the reason I bought the stock and, and blogged about it so the world would know is I felt that I wanted to at least look at the company from that, you know, have my, my, my stake on the grill. and. Uh, uh, Look at it that way. Um, I guess I'll go to it from a very meta way, that Google already is the leader in so many ways that it's not as if there's some little trick that Google can do to say, oh, we didn't think of that, and that's going to increase the value. I, I think that I would go back to this idea of Google's leadership because it is so big, because it is so success successful and so powerful. So as I would say that, that I want Google to stand up for free speech, I also want Google to come out and uh, support innovation, invention, and optimism. And that it's the best platform for doing that. So that not just Google.org, I don't mean with its money, I don't mean with its resource, I mean with its experience and its lessons. Um, and maybe the next book is not my book, the next book is Google's book, to say here's what we should do with the country and the world, here's how we can support the creation of hundreds of new Googles. And I think no, better, no company can do that more than this company to try to reveal its ways and push the principle of innovation as our way out of this mess. The book is What Would Google Do? And we say thank you to Jeff Jarvis for being with us. Today. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, it's great fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Were great. Well, you did your research. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I was a journalist. Yeah, yeah exactly.